lost. Um, so our next speaker is Ankit Bahaguna, and he'll be talking about query embeddings, uh, web scale search powered by deep learning and Python. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I will be talking about query embeddings, uh, which is our system which we have developed at Clix, uh, which does uh, use deep learning, and the system in is entirely built in Python. Uh, a bit about myself, uh, I'm a software engineer and research at Clix. Uh, I have a background in computer science and natural language processing uh, and deep learning. Uh, we are building a web search engine, which is part of a web browser. Uh, and also the browser works on mobile too. Uh, the areas that interest me are NLP, information retrieval, deep learning, and I also am a Mozilla representative since 2012. Uh, so about clicks, we are based in Munich. Uh, it's majority owned by Hubert Buddha Media. Uh, we are an international team of 90 experts from 28 different countries, and we combine the power of data, search and browsers so that we are redefining the browsing experience. Uh, our website is clicks.com and you can actually like check out our browsers. Uh, so here I'm talking about search, so I'll start with it. So search at clicks looks something like this. So when you open your web browser, what you usually do is you go for a link or you go for a search term. What clicks experience gives you is a web browser with the address bar, which is intelligent enough to directly give you the site based on what your query is. So say if you're searching for something like Python wiki, if you will get a Python wiki link. If you want to search for like weather in Bilbao, you'll get like the weather snippet. Uh, and interestingly, I found out that on Monday, that's today, it's 41 degrees, so take care. Uh, and of course, if you want to search for news, you'll get like real-time news. So it's a combination of a lot of data uh, built into a browser with like the technology of search behind it. So it's all three things combined. So a bit historically about how traditional search works. Uh, so traditionally search for us, so search ha is a very long studded problem. And by search I mean information retrieval or the web search. Uh, and what they used to come up with was create a vector model of your documents and your query and then do a match at real time. And the aim of the whole process was to come up with like the best URLs or the best documents for the user query. Over the time, what we found out, like search engines evolved. There was, the web became rich with web 2.0. There was a lot of media which came in and people expected more from the web. To come up with our search story, uh, search at clicks is based on to match a user query with a query in our index. And our index is based on query logs. So if you type Facebook or FB, it has to go to facebook.com. Given search an index, uh, you can actually construct a much more meaningful search result experience for the user because it's enriched by how many times people actually query and lead to the same page. So what we aim is we construct alternative queries given a user query. So if we find it directly, it's great. But if something which is, which is different or we have not seen before, we would try to construct them at runtime and try to search for those results in our index. And broadly, our index looks something like this. So you have a query, and it has URL IDs, which means a URL ID is linked to some hashing value, and that URL is the actual URL that people go to given the query. And there are these frequency counts and everything, which actually allows us to make a prediction, okay, this page is the rightful page uh, that the user actually intended. To give an overview of the search problem itself in a bit more depth, uh, the search problem can actually be seen as a two-step process. Uh, first one is recall, the second one is ranking. So given your index of like billions of pages, what you try to aim at is like get the most best set of candidate pages that you can say, okay, given a user query, that should correspond to them. So say I say I want to get the 10,000 pages or 10,000 URLs from my billions of pages which best fit the query. And then the problem comes up is the ranking problem. The ranking problem means given these 10,000 pages, what we want is give me the top 10, 100, three results. As you might know that given any search engine result page, the second page is a dead page. So everybody concerns about the first page. So it's very important to have the top five or top three results as the best result for your query. And that's all we care about at clicks. At clicks, what we want is like, Given a user query, 
we tried to come up with three best results from our two billion pages in the index. So where does deep learning come up? So what we aim at uh, clicks is like, uh, we are trying a traditional method of search using fuzzy matching the words in the query to a document, but then we are also use, utilizing something which is a bit deeper and a bit different. Uh, which is using something called semantic vectors, or distributed representation of words. Uh, what we actually try to do is we represent our queries as vectors. So a vector is like a fixed dimensional uh, floating point list of numbers. Uh, and uh, what we try to do is, given a query and given a vector, that vector should semantically understand the meaning of the query. Uh, this particular thing is called uh, distributed representation, where the words which appear in the same context share semantic meaning. And the meaning of the query is defined by this vector. These query vectors are learned in an unsupervised yet supervised manner, uh, where we focus on the context of the words in the sentences or the queries and learn the same. And the area that we actually study this thing is called neural probabilistic language model. Uh, similarity between these queries uh, is measured as a cosine distance between two vectors. So if two vectors are close together in the vector space, so they are more similar. And hence what we do is that we try to get the closest queries based on how, which are the closest vectors in space are to the user query vector. And this gives us a recall set, or the first set that we can actually fetch from our index which most accurately correspond to our user query. So a simple example of, uh, to illustrate this is like, say a user types a simple query like Sims game PC download, which is a game. What our system actually gives us is uh, sort of a list of these queries along with their cosine distance to the query vector that user typed. So uh, given the query Sims game PC download, we get like a sort of a sorted list where the first one is like the most closest to, uh, to Sims game PC download. Uh, bear in mind, like, it's, it's a bit different to understand because we are not doing a word-to-word -word match, but a vector-to-vector -vector match. So the vector for the query Sims Game PC to, uh, Sims Game PC download is much closer to, to download Game PC Sims. Now this is coming from our search backend, which is bag of words, uh, because we want to optimize the space as well. Uh, so eventually the vector comes out to be the same. And the values on the right are the cosine distances. So as we move down, the cosine distance increases, and we'll see, like, we'll start getting some uh, a bit far off results. So we are usually concerned about, like, top 50 closest queries that come through this system. So a bit more about uh, how this learning process works and what, what we're actually utilizing in production is we use something uh, called an unsupervised deep learning technique to learn these word representation. So effectively, what we want to learn is like, given uh, the continuous representation of the word, we would like the distance of like two words, CW minus CW dash, to reflect a meaningful similarity. So for example, if there's a vector like king, and you subtract that uh, like a vector of man, and then you add a vector of woman, you'll probably get a vector which is close to vector of queen. And uh, the algorithm that defines this uh, is word to vec uh, and we learn this uh, representation and the corresponding vectors. So uh, a bit more about word to vec uh, It was actually given by Mikulov in 2013, where he had two different models, where continuous bag of words representation and continuous skip gram model. Uh, this we focus on, again, uh, distributed representations that are learned by neural networks. Uh, both models are trained using stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation. Uh, a bit more a visual uh, indication of how this works uh, is like in a CBA or a continuous bag of words model on the left, we have like a context words of five words, say, and we want to try to predict the center word. So given like uh, the cat sat on mat, uh, the word sat has to be predicted given the uh, other context words. Uh, and the skip gram model does the exact reverse. So given the center word in the sentence or a context window, you try to predict the surrounding words. Uh, so given these two models, you can actually like define uh, these vectors for each word that you see as a lookup table, and you can learn them uh, using uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, I'll probably skip this uh, because this has a lot of math in it, but still. Uh, uh, so what we try to optimize is uh, a neural privacy language model tries to optimize 
uh, given uh, how many times you see a particular word given the context and given how many times you see a word not in its context. So a best language model will actually say, okay, given a certain sequence of words, you'll see the next word, and given a certain sequence of words, you will not see a certain word. And that's what the model actually learns. And <clears throat> this is one other example of how a traditional language model actually works. So for example, this, the cat sits on the mat. You try to predict what is the probability of mat coming after the sequence uh, in a certain uh, vocabulary dictionary that you have. Uh, but the only uh, cash here is that we have to worry about is like your vocabulary could be very, very huge. So what you might look at is like you want to try to predict the probability of a word. Say you have seven to 10 million words in your vocabulary. You want to predict the probability of your one single word across all of them. So to avoid this scheme, uh, what we use something called noise contrastive estimation, uh, where we actually don't use the entire vocabulary to test our word against. Uh, what we do is like we say, okay, we pick a set of five noisy words or 10 noisy words. So for this particular sequence, the cat sits on the mat, you're pretty much sure that uh, uh, the mat is the right word, but so can be other words. But then say the cat sits on the hair or something like that. So these words will not be the exact sequence that you will find in day to day life. And you can pick those words at random from a uniform distribution and get these noisy words as your training examples. So what effectively your model learns right now, given the sequence, what is the right word to, to get next as a next word, and given the sequence, which are not the right words. So if the system differentiates this over and over again with millions of examples, and you train this over certain iterations, you'll probably get a model which is able to differentiate the, the position of the right words with the position of the bad words, separated by, with a clear distance. Uh, so let's see like how this uh, will work with an example itself. Uh, so for example, uh, there is a document like the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And we have a context window size of one. Uh, we say, okay, uh, given like the first three words, the quick brown fox, I have the center word quick and the surrounding words as the and brown. So I want to uh, get in a continuous bag of word model, what I want is like, can you predict quick based on the and brown? So it's just like a very simple example. Uh, but at production, we found like skip Gram does much better. So effectively, what we try to find out is like, uh, we try to predict the context word from a tar target word. So we predict the and brown from quick. So given quick, predict what is the probability of the, predict what is the probability of brown. And the objective function is defined over the entire data set. So whatever data set we have, uh, our data set is built on a lot of uh, Wikipedia data, a lot of query data, title descriptions that we have, and a lot of other textual data that we have to actually learn uh, how the queries are formed or how sentences are formed or what is the sequence of these words. And we use SGD for this. Uh, say at train time t, we have like a certain case. Uh, we have quick and the, and our goal is to predict the from quick. So we select like some noisy examples, say like, uh, say num noise is like one, and we say sheep. Sheep should not be like, part of this. So uh, next we compute a loss for this pair of observers and noisy examples and we get this objective function. So what we try to do is uh, given this, which is like a log uh, of the value of the score. So given the probability, which is the correct, sen uh, correct piece of sentence or correct piece of context, uh, the and Q should be given a score of one and given like a quick and sheep, uh, the score should be zero. So if you update the value of theta because that, that depends on it, uh, we can maximize this objective function as like a logistic uh, like log likelihood and we can actually do a gradient descent on top of it. So we perform an update on the embeddings and we repeat this process over and over again for different examples over the entire corpus and we come up with like a lookup table for words and of vectors. So we can define the dimensionality of a vector. Uh, as I said in my slide, that we use 100 as dimensions to represent that word, and does pretty well for us. Uh, so how do these word embeddings actually look like, uh, or what we have actually learned, is something like this. So if you, if you see uh, like uh, the word vectors, or like you project these vectors in space, what you find is like uh, the vector for man and woman uh, is roughly equidistant uh, from like king and queen. Uh, and you'll find this not just variation in gender, but also variation like verb tense. 
like walking and walked and swimming and swam because uh, you might have sentences where like uh, the guy or the person is walking and the person is running or he walks or he runs would occur in the same uh, context. And this is what the model actually captures pretty nicely. Uh, and not just that, we actually also have like some other informational features like countries and capitals like Spain and Madrid, uh, or Italy and Rome, Germany and Berlin. So these are like country capital relationships. Uh, this uh, is like a projection uh, on a 2D scale using TSNE, where you actually can see, uh, I mean, it's a bit short, but you can actually see like some characters here uh, at the bottom, and uh, here on the top you'll have like may, should, would, uh, uh, some here like more, less, some more adjective identifiers, and this is like a projection that you can see if you see the more uh, semantically meaning words are actually closer in vector space. And this is a very important property because if you can try to leverage this and construct like sentence or document representation, you'll probably get like similar documents in space as well. And that is what query embeddings addresses. So the way we generate a query vector using these word vectors is like for the same query, same scheme PC download, we have a vector for each of these words. Uh, what we do is like we just don't use these word vectors as it gets uh, the term relevance. And term relevance for us is a bit uh, uh, sort of a custom process that we come up with. But actually what you see is like you'll get a score uh, for each term in the, in the query. So this tells us like sims is the most important relevant word in the query because it's the name or the name identifier. And next week what we do is uh, we use this uh, term relevance and also a vector to calculate like a vector average of these uh, of these vectors. Uh, so uh, what a weighted average actually means is like, say given two vectors uh, of two different words and their weights or their term relevance, you do a NumPy average and you'll get like an average representation of those words. And effectively, what we actually say our query vector is, is this average representation. So given our vector and the term relevance, we get like this average representation. And this represents our query vector. So effectively at the end, same scheme PC download is nothing but this a hundred dimensional vector. And that is what we use as our query vector. Uh, a bit uh, about term relevance. Uh, so we have two different modes of term relevance. Uh, usually it is uh, the frequency of the words that you find, but it's not uh, very good uh, for scale. Uh, also like you use something like TF-IDF or these sort of representations. Uh, but what we have used is something called TF-5TF is like uh, given the number of queries linked to a page, how many times that term has occurred in those top five queries. And that's a much better uh, indication to us given the data on the data that we have, uh, that we can uh, roughly say that yeah, given the word statistics, give me this number and give me the knock frequency, I'll get something like an absolute term relevance. Uh, and the relative one is actually sort of a normalization on the, all the pages that we have in our index. Uh, what we found out is like, if you normalize your scores across all the pages of your index, uh, the vectors are slightly better and get slightly better results. And these all are data dependent. Uh, we compute them on the fly uh, each time we refresh our index. And for example, this looks something like this. For each word, you'll have like features like frequency, document frequency, uh, you have U, Q, F, and all the other stuff. And similarly for all the other words as well. So <clears throat> we, what we actually create uh, uh, is like a query vector index now. So given our traditional index which has all the documents, we have all the queries and their vectors, uh, and we try to do a query vector lookup. Uh, so we cannot do this for all the queries because there are just too many queries. So what we found out is like, given all the pages are indexed, we can actually just pick the top five queries which effectively represent the page. And uh, we call them as top queries, uh, and from the page models, we can actually get this data. So roughly we come up with like 465 million queries uh, which represent all the pages in our index. And we try to learn a query vectors for each one of them. Uh, and if you just like dump the whole system on disk, it's like around 700 gigs. And what we actually have the problem now is like, how do we get similar queries from these 465 million queries? So given a user query, find me the closest 50 queries from this 465 million queries. So how do we find closest queries? Should we use brute force? It's too slow. It's too, too slow. We cannot use hashing techniques that effectively because it's not very accurate for vectors because these vectors are semantic. Even a small loss in precision 
could lead to like haywire results. So what a solution actually required was the application of a cosine similarity metric. Uh, somehow we could have to scale for like 465 million queries and take 10 milliseconds or less. So the way we came up with the answer was something called approximate nearest neighbor vector model. Uh, and they were actually pretty helpful for us. So what the model that we use is called Enoy. It is uh, a C++ and Python wrapper uh, that exists for this uh, to build the approximate nearest neighbor models for all the vectors uh, of queries that we have. Enoy is actually used in production at Spotify and now at Clicks as well. Uh, we can train all on the 465 million uh, documents at once, but it's too slow because it is uh, sort of memory intensive. Uh, so what we do is like we don't train them all of them together. Uh, we have uh, a cluster where we actually host these models along with our search index. So we train them uh, as 10 models with like 46 million queries each, and we train it on 10 trees. What these trees actually mean, I'll explain next. And the size of the model is like around 27 gigs per per shard. 27 gigs per shard. That what you get after training, which is like around 270 gigs if you sh if you just scale it to 10 models. And everything is stored in RAM, because for us, the most important thing is latency. Uh, given a search, you want the results to happen pretty quickly. Later, I'll show a demo of uh, how this thing actually uh, is used in production. Um, and then what, at runtime, what you try to do is like you query all these 10 shards simultaneously, and then sort them based on what cosine distances that you get. So your different parts of your shards might have different closest queries. So eventually, what you'd want is like, you want is like the best representation of those queries which are closely matching the user query. And where we actually found a nice cutoff was like 755. 55 is a heuristical number, as how many nearest queries would be very good for the system. That doesn't really like uh, decrease our um, recall or anything, or latency for that matter, because this has a huge latency cost as well. So by, by first, uh, I want to actually explain like how we actually use Annoy. Uh, and how Enoy actually works. Uh, it's it's uh, one of the nice frameworks that you can actually use if you are using uh, vector calculus or like uh, using like something vector-based approaches for your uh, recalls or ranking. Um, and we try to find out the nearest point uh, to any query point in like a sub in sublinear time. So what you try to find out is like uh, you cannot do it one by one, so it's not O of n. What you want to do is like try to do it in sublinear time. Can you get it uh, get those closest queries in like log of n time? And the best case data structure for that is a tree. So given like all your query vectors are represented by like each point represents a single query, what you try to find out is like, say, uh, given uh, a certain point, which is the nearest point, or like a, a user vector, uh, which is like a user query vector, it's some random point on the space, find me the nearest ones. So to train that model first, uh, to build that tree, what you do is like you just split this, uh, this type of space uh, recursively. So you split, take two points at random, and split the space. You do it again, and then you get something like a tree. Uh, so you have like a certain segmentation of certain number of points in the cluster, uh, which are like in different parts of the tree. You keep splitting, and you end up with a huge binary tree. The nice point about this binary tree is like the points that are close to each other in space are more likely to be close to each other in the tree itself. So if you are trying to navigate through a node and you try to come up with like some child nodes, that whole uh, track or that whole branch would be composed of all the similar nodes uh, in the vector space. And this is a very important feature. So how do we search for a point in, the, in, the tree, in the, these splits that we have built? So say that uh, x, uh, the red x is our like, user query vector. And we try to find out, okay, which are the nearest vectors to this particular vector and give me the queries related to it. So what you do is, like, you end up with, like, you search for a point and you just jot down the path uh, from the binary tree. Uh, and you will get, like, these, okay, seven neighbors that you get. And you use, like, a cosine metric, so how close it is. If it's very close to, like, between 0 and 0.5, it's much, much more closer. If it's more than 1, because cosine takes values between minus 2 and 2, so then you can actually decide, okay, how close your vector is. Uh, but here, what the problem is, like, we only see, like, seven neighbors coming. What if we want more neighbors? What if we want more than seven closest queries? So what we'd use is something called, we don't just navigate through one branch of the tree. We can actually navigate to the second branch of the tree. And 
this is uh, maintained in sort of a, pr a priority queue, and we can actually traverse both the, both the parts of the tree and get like these closest vectors. And so you don't uh, not only like look at the right with the light blue part, but also like a slightly darker blue part. So you see both the sides of the tree because that's where the split occurs, and you can find okay, uh, both of these uh, uh, sort of areas in hyperspace are like closer to the user vector. But sometimes you'll find like uh, because we did it randomly, what happens is like you can actually miss out on some nice zones because you just split across two different points. So what you do is like to minimize this, you train a forest of trees and it actually looks something like this. So you not only like train on like a certain s a sequence of, uh, of splits, but you randomize those across say 10 trees. So effectively your model learns these 10 configurations at once and searches for them in real time in parallel. And this gives you like a pretty good representation because when you sort them and get like good query representations, you'll get like some good uh, similarity between queries. So we train a forest of trees. So uh, one uh, bad or like a missing feature in Noi or like maybe it's a feature not a bug uh, is like it doesn't let you store string values, but it actually allows you to store indexes. So you can actually store like for a query sims game PC download. Uh, give this like a unique index, say like five or one, and that one will be stored with the vector and that model will be learned. So when you query NOI, you'll get like an index back of all the indexes which are close to it. So what we, uh, what we have at Clicks is like we have developed a system called Kiwi, which is like a key value index, which is also responsible for our entire search index. Uh, we found it is much better than uh, Redis uh, or anything uh, to compare with in terms of reads and maintainability. Uh, we developed it in-house. It's written in C++ with Python wrappers again. And uh, it actually stores your index to query representation. So what you effectively see is uh, given a user query, uh, you'll get a query vector. You search within the annoy models the, the closest query vectors. You'll get indexes for these. Then you query the Kiwi index. You'll get all the queries. And effectively, you can fetch the pages for all the queries that are closest to the user query. And this is how we improve our recall. Uh, and the results are pretty, pretty amazing in the sense uh, that we get much richer set of uh, candidate pages after the first, first fetching step with like a higher possibility of expected pages among them. And the reason it is going this way is because now we are going beyond synonyms or doing a simple fuzzy match, but actually using how vectors are learned semantically. It screws up sometimes, but most of the time you'll find like there is a definite improvement because you'll ha you always try to learn those words which are near to the context. And th that's a very important feature. And queries are now matched in real time using a cosine vector similarity between query, query vectors, plus using the classical information retrieval techniques that we use at clicks. Uh, and overall, there's a recall improvement from previous release uh, that we had was around 5 to 7%. So it's the improvement that we find on internal tests that how much we are improving on this. And translated improvement in the final top three results is around 1%. So uh, that gives us a clear ad uh, identification of where these vectors are actually uh, are useful or not. And the system actually triggers only for those queries which we have never seen before. So that's also like a, a very, very important uh, point here because for the seen queries like FB or Google, you actually land it to a certain page. You're definitely sure about it. But for queries which are not seen before, which are new to us, which are not in an index, you have to go beyond the traditional techniques. And this one technique actually helps a lot. So uh, before I conclude, like, I actually wanted to show like, what the browser actually looks like. So this is like a clicks browser. Uh, and this is the search page. Uh, and we actually have this snippet which comes up. The idea of this was to re reduce that whole step of search engine result page. And you can actually get like directly to our page. So uh, the libraries are like Spotify and I, uh, which is again available on GitHub, uh, Kiwi, which is Clicks OSS, uh, and a GitHub that you'll actually find. Uh, it's pretty useful. It's a pretty active project as well. Uh, uh, Vertivec can be trained using uh, Genzim uh, if you want to do a prototype, but I would recommend to use the original C code uh, because it's, uh, it's a bit more optimized, and we found like there are certain variations in like the models that are developed uh, because of the comment history that we see. Uh, there are other Clicks OS projects that you can actually contribute to. 
if you want to find the slides, it, it is uh, actually on speaker deck. Uh, it's QE Python, uh, uh, bit.ly slash QE Python. Uh, so before I conclude, uh, uh, I'll just say this thing that we are still uh, like working on this system. Uh, we have like a first version of this thing ready, but we are trying to look up at other approaches of deep learning, like using something called long and short-term memory networks. Uh, the only downside of that approach is like uh, most of these user queries are like keyword based and you don't usually find people actually typing, okay, what is the height of Statue of Liberty, uh, those sort of things. You'll probably say Statue of Liberty height. And that sort of linguistic relationships uh, may be well captured by LSTMs. They are more complicated, but uh, this system is like simple enough to still give you pretty good results. So we are trying to uh, use this new metric that we have into ranking. Uh, we are trying to uh, use this query to page similarity using document vectors, where again we are using like a sort of a differentiated LSTM model or like a paragraph to vectors model. And we are trying to also improve our search system for there are some pages which are never queried before. So we, we have a lot of lists of these pages. We try to find out uh, what, uh, what could be the best way to represent those pages. So either using vectors or traditional n-grams approach or something like this. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I'll say thank you. And I'll finish with this quote. Uh, which was given by John Rupert Frith in 1957, where he said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And Mikolo actually developed a model uh, using the same contextual approach of words, and it actually helped us give good results. So, thank you. Uh, any questions? So uh, one of the reasons we had was like, uh, we wanted like a unified, we, so we tried a lot of these key value stores ourselves. We tried Redis, we tried like a traditional database, we tried Elasticsearch, uh, but what we found is like, our needs are a bit different in the sense that we sometimes have a vector index where we need like our values should be a list of vectors. Sometimes it is just strings. Sometimes they are repeated strings where like uh, you will have the same JSON data structure again and again. So we can actually optimize it more if we can write those parts of the code ourselves. We started by doing that. So, uh, I mean, Kiwi is a much bigger project here, and I'm not really the expert in it. But what I can say is, like, it has a lot of features in, like, uh, you can actually, like, compress your keys. You can do a message pack uh, a sort of compression using Zlib or Snappy. And that gives you, like, a much cohesive vector. It's faster to index, it's faster to read, and it's scalable in terms that we don't actually have to put this in memory, uh, we can actually still have it in disk and do a memory map. So you can still have like lots of data that you can train. Uh, what we actually wanted in our use case was we wanted reads to be optimized because we don't have writes at all. We can compile the index at once and then what we want at runtime is like user query and give data from the index. For that, Kiwi works pretty nicely for us. on the database. You were already talking about having no rights on the database. I was wondering how you handle having new, new data, new queries, uh, new data to train uh, your embeddings uh, or uh, uh, embeddings, uh, I would say, uh, near, nearest neighbor index. Yeah, because so uh, from what I know, there, there are still no, no very, no, not in, there, there have no, there are no implementations of nearest neighbors that can, you know, just update the index. Yeah, so uh, it's true. Uh, so what we do is like we have a release cycle where we compile each NOI index every month and we have, we also like get new queries and new query vectors for this. So it's not like a one-time system, but it's true. Like say immediately if tomorrow I want to include like a set of results which are like new queries for tomorrow, I cannot do that. But to address the same issue, we have news. So the news vertical actually handles this. So for the most recent part of like say anything that is trending uh, right now, you'll have like in the news section. So given like the concepts, you usually find like say Pokemon Go was already available on Wikipedia before its release. 
So you actually have these concepts which are uh, already learned from Wikipedia data, and that's what we use. So you can always learn the concept for the new words like some, some XYD, uh, XYZ Gen X word which comes Gen Y word that comes up like tomorrow. You probably not have it, but it's, it's a very hard problem anyway. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, let's give a big hand of applause. Uh